um, I thought we might begin by noting that the, what we can see with our sense organs is an extremely narrow band of what there is to see, and this is particularly so with the visual sense, and we can see a tiny narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum, the rainbow, but the rainbow's width is tiny compared to the vast expanse of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the urge to think of our senses as being powerful or, or good is strong, because first, that's all we have. Second, we like having nice thoughts about ourselves rather than miserable, depressing thoughts. So we're prone to walk around celebrating, for example, the power of sight or of taste or of smell. When, of course, when you really want to smell something, you, you bring a dog and they smell, their nose smells much better than your nose smells. I was going to say the dog smells better than you, but that would insult you. So <laughs> their nose smells. So we already know that our senses are feeble and we reach to other creatures in the animal kingdom, cite them as having better examples of our sight, of our taste, of our smell. But little did people know much before a century and a half ago that our sense of vision is limited only, as Richard said, to the colors of the rainbow. And it's quite extraordinary to realize that, for example, beyond red, there's something called infrared. And beyond infrared, there are microwaves. And beyond microwaves, there are radio waves. Go the other direction, you go beyond violet, ultraviolet. Beyond that, X-rays, gamma rays. Energy goes up as you approach gamma rays with dramatic consequences if you have gamma ray exposure, by the way. Of course, we all know you turned big, green, and ugly, as <laughs> the Hulk had experienced. <laughs> but the point is, the visible light part of that spectrum is a tiny slice, and the universe doesn't only communicate with us through that slice, as we had taken for granted for so long. Most of the history of the telescope, which is itself an extension of our eyes, extended the power of our eyes, but not the range of our eyes. And it wasn't until uh, we first understood maybe we're missing something in the 19th century. The 20th century came decade by decade, new telescopes in each newly discovered band of light. And only then did we learn about black holes in the universe or uh, uh, remarkable, violent forces operating in the centers of galaxies discovered by radio telescopes. So, yeah, we're practically blind out there, and it's humbling, by the way, but that's the whole point of the methods and tools of science, to not only extend your senses in the domain in which you understand, but to take them to places they've never been before. On top of that, we have methods and tools that detect things that are not even extensions of your senses. You, 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 don't, you have no clue what the magnetic field is around your body right now. You have no clue whether or not you're being bathed in ionizing radiation right now. You'll eventually figure that out <laughs> as limbs start falling off. But while it's happening, you actually don't know. And uh, there are other things that are more subtle, like polarization of light. So when I think of the scientist's toolkit, especially the astrophysicist's toolkit, it's all about how many different senses can you bring to bear technological senses can you bring to bear on decoding the universe?